United States. The organizing foundation of that movement was built on public learning processes through what were called the citizenship schools. Um, so we've got evidence there. The second wave of the women's movement in the 1970s was also built on a kind of collaborative social communal research into the everyday lives of women that led to policy recommendations, that led to the mobilization and organization of communities based on the new knowledge that was created through a critical examination of their everyday lives through collaborative processes, but we don't really know the degree to which we're going to be able to accomplish that. Um, I think it remains a, a huge challenge about managing different time frames of uh, research processes, deliberative processes, and you have the 24-hour news cycle going all the time. You also have the press of the crises themselves. People really are suffering. People are dying. Um, because of what's happening, bless you, what's happening um, in all these crises in the state. Um, so how do we respond to that and how do we keep people engaged over the long haul and, and to change um, the institutions that were created in the 19th century, like schools and hospitals and many of the other sort of social governmental agencies that, that were our 19th century inventions, and to change these institutions um, requires a broad time frame. So how do we keep people engaged and not becoming cynical, not giving up? Um, I don't know, right? These are very, very difficult. Overcoming the kind of power imbalances that I talked about and building a level of trust um, between the, or among the university and communities and policymakers to do this kind of work. I don't know how that's going to work out. Sometimes it may work well, other times not. So I think the challenges in this work are enormous. Um, how we're going to just manage the internal changes within the university in terms of evaluating this work within the, the promotion and tenuring processes for faculty. Um, I know we're going to have a lot of battles there. I know we're going to have a lot of battles in terms of how we evaluate the competencies of our doctoral students. Um, and every other institution, whether it's schools or hospitals or social service agencies, that are similarly structured in ways that, that are not friendly toward this kind of reimagining and recreating the public sphere. Um, to have it be more based in, in collaborative work and, and, and social knowledge production and not leaving that just to the experts at the university, but saying we are all involved in creating the kinds of new knowledge that are going to be necessary um, to transform our society in response to the, the present crisis. So I don't mean to minimize any of that. Uh, we've The center has been in existence uh, only about nine months now, and um, I'm looking for money. If any of you uh, know people with bags of money sitting around that want to throw it in the direction of a, what I think is a very worthwhile experiment, um, let me know. I'm happy to talk to them. And no contribution is too small or too large. Um, I'm also trying to uh, just mobilize faculty across the University of California system and um, convince them that it's worth taking a risk in terms of their own promotion processes. Um, you know, doctoral students are contacting me, you know, what's going to happen if I try to do this? If I pursue this kind of research, is it going to be accepted by my committees? Is it going to be accepted in my department? Who's going to hire me afterwards? Am I just going to be identified like you as an ideologue and not really? I'm, I'm a philosopher, and some people say, you're not really a philosopher. You're something else, right? Some people say I'm a community organizer. I've never been a community organizer, and I think I would be a bad one if I were. Um, but you know, these are the kinds of challenges um, that we're facing, and we're just at the beginning of this. And I know from the conversations I've heard today in trying to reimagine the doctoral programs here and recreate them, you're facing many of the, the same challenges. And I would encourage you that as you're thinking about your EDD um, and these practice-oriented doctorates, um, 
don't get trapped within thinking about schools as the, the totality of the educational domain. And don't get trapped within the idea that you can make changes entirely within schools that are going to produce different life outcomes for the students who are now struggling in your schools here in Great Britain. Um, it just, I, I think all the evidence, and we all know the evidence from just our daily lives and working in, in those kinds of environments, we know that that's not enough. And until we begin to do research that recognizes that paying attention to schools just as schools is not enough, then we're not going to really be able to solve the problem. So it's, we're, we're, at a, we're at a moment in history where we need to think really boldly. We're being overrun um, by the collapse of, of uh, a world that has existed for 150, 200 years. And um, I, I fear that we're not doing enough to think creatively um, beyond the confines of, of the old institutional structure. So I encourage you to think beyond schooling um, as you think about how to prepare yourself for leadership in schools, right? If your leadership within schools is only paying attention to what's happening in schools, I, I fear you're not going to be able to solve your challenges. So thank you very much for your attention.